I am told we have Mr. Barney on the line, so let's uh, hook up and talk football with Hall of Famer Lem Barney. Lem, it's Bob, yes. and, it's Bob and Tony here in our Eastern Connecticut studio. It's a pleasure to speak with you again, sir. Hi, Lem. Yes, you as well, Bob and Tony. Good to see you, you guys again. Lem, we, uh, we, uh, Chris Mascaro and myself had the chance to speak with you two weeks ago on Thursday Night Tailgate, and um, you told us at the time you'd be happy to come on. So now you're on the TV side, so you're making the rounds, and Chris sends his regards. And again, uh, anytime we're in the presence of a Hall of Famer, it's, it's an honor. And again, we Certainly thank you is, for your, all your cooperation. Uh, we loved watching you play, and... We loved talking to you a couple weeks ago, and again, uh, thanks for giving us some time this evening, sir. No worries at all, brother. I'm glad to do it. Okay, Lem, uh, I mean, we have a bunch of questions. I'm going to try to just go in order, and uh, we like to talk like we're in the living room, so uh, watching a game. So, But uh, I, we, we may talk about this, a lot of the same things we did on the show a couple weeks ago, but... We always like to know about uh, our guests, some of the early sports you played, Lem, and maybe some of your heroes growing up. No worries. Is that a question now? Yeah, uh, Lem, I just was wondering about the early sports that you played when you were a, a young kid and maybe some of your early heroes. Okay, well, uh, my sports that I played uh, as a young man coming up, uh, Middle school, I played out in San Bernardino at Sturgis Junior High. And after that, I came back home to Gulfport, Mississippi. I got home sick and played at 33rd Avenue High School. My high school uh, uh, graduated from there and then on to Jackson State from there. And then from Jackson State on into the league uh, with the Detroit Lions for an 11-year career. Uh, I played baseball as well. Uh, uh, enjoyed playing baseball, played basketball in high school, and, and ran track. So was pretty much all around four four star uh, athlete. And Lem, who were some of the greatest influences you had while you were growing up? I'm sure your parents, coaches were there. There had to be some special people that paved the way for you. Well, absolutely. Uh, my mom and dad were motivators, and uh, they they loved and supported me and everything that I took place in, even being a Boy Scout. But the sports, they were always uh, <laughs> concerned about the football because of how how competitive the game was. But uh, they allowed me to play, and uh, the support that they gave me, they followed me everywhere in high school and uh, caught a, quite a few of my co college games and uh, followed me uh, in, in a few states uh, during the uh, pro years as well. So... Uh, my mom, Bertie L. Barney, and Lem Barney uh, were great inspirations for me. And some of the uh, gentlemen that uh, was icons for me uh, coming up as a ball player in high school and in college was the late, great Dick Night Train Lane, mm -hmm. uh, who, who, who ended up scouting me and uh, having the Detroit Lions to draft me in the second round in 1967. But Night Train... Uh, kept encouraging me to continue to play like I was. They say, look, you, you, you're going to be hot in the league. Uh, you perhaps be drafted number one, but wasn't drafted number one. I was drafted number two. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, it was a joy uh, having him to uh, give me some inspiration uh, about leaving college and getting drafted in the league. And in 1967, was picked second round behind the dear friend of mine and uh, great brother, Mel Farr, who was number one mm -hmm. draft choice in the 67 draft. Just a little more background before I pass you over to Tony about Lem Barney. 56 career interceptions. Tony, again, as he mentioned, attended Jackson State. Second round draft choice, 1967. Was the league's defensive rookie of the year that year where he picked off 10 passes in his rookie year. Played 11 years in Detroit. In 1999, ranked in the top 100 greatest football players of all time, well Tony. Deserved. And his number 20, which was also worn by guys like Billy Sims and Barry Sanders, was uh, ultimately retired <coughs> by the Lions. And we'll get to a little bit of his Motown career as we go on. <laughs> but, I can't wait to talk about that. But, uh, Tony, <laughs> Tony, question for Lem. Lem, you know, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you, and I love watching you through the years. And... I wanted to know, you know, going through your mind, coming off the college campus and going to the Detroit Lions, you know, the black and blue division, Alex Karras, Mike Lucci, was this a culture <laughs> shock for you? <laughs> Not really. Uh, and, and ironically <laughs> enough, 
the only game that I could catch on Thanksgiving from high school through college was Detroit Lions and the Pittsburgh and, and the Green Bay Packers. Mm. They played every Thanksgiving, and I mean, you know, the nation watched the Lions mm-hmm. and the Packers on Thanksgiving. And again, as I mentioned, uh, Dick Knight Train Lane came uh, my junior year and told me if I kept playing the way I was playing another year, he was going to try to get the Lions to draft me. And again, it happened. But you know, watching the Packers and the Lions play was a joy. And uh, I love uh, watching Dick LeBeau, who I became a teammate of, playing uh, Yale Larry and uh, mm-hmm. Coach Joe Schmidt, who coached me my first seven mm-hmm. years, all playing on Thanksgiving. It was just a joy watching them. And now, you know, uh, second round, I was drafted by the Detroit Lions. But it, it, it was a joy watching them. But Night Train was a great inspiration for me because he even came down to the college campus after uh, – I was drafted by the Lions and uh, worked with me on some of the fundamentals and techniques that was going to be very important for me to manifest while I was in the league. And I still remember Train uh, fondly. And may his soul rest in peace. Yeah, for mm-hmm. certain. Now, did you know uh, in knowing Dick LeBeau back then that he would turn out to be the fine coach that he is now, the great coach? Well, you know, Dick is uh, <clears throat> he's from Ohio, played at Ohio State. Mm-hmm. He's, I think he's got a uh, a football uh, heart, he, uh, and I really mean that. Mm-hmm. He, he's still coaching. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He played like 16, maybe 17 years in the league, and I mean, just a great gentleman and uh, helped me tremendously uh, when I came into the league and uh, taught me a lot of things outside of what Jimmy David, who was a defensive back with Joe Schmidt during the 53 and the – 57 championship, uh, who was a great icon for me as well, the late, great Jimmy David. and But Dick LeBeau was just a gentleman, a, a great guy. and I mean, I could just remember, I can see him right now, and, and, and I laugh about it often. Uh, Mike Lucci would call a play in the huddle when we'd get out, and then after the, the huddle would break, Dick LeBeau would look over me and say, Hey, kid! i say, Yeah, what is it, Dick? He'd say, Don't let him get behind you. <laughs> 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 Make it simple. Yeah. yeah. That's great stuff. Again, as we talk to Hall of Famer Lem Barney, we have uh, various pictures on the television screen at various times during his career. Uh, some great shots there. And, uh, you know, that 67 rookie year, Lem, you, you picked off 10 balls. Was that back in the day? Did they do what they do now? Kind of test rookies out? I mean, they were going your way, but it didn't turn out well for them, Lem. <laughs> No, uh, and, and I mean, I really enjoyed it. And ironically, uh, the Packers were a second favorite team of mine mm. because they played the Detroit Lions again, as I mentioned. Every Thanksgiving, it was the Lions and the Packers played. And, and, and I had a, a uh, special eye for Bart Starr, uh, who was the quarterback, but I, because I went to Jackson State as a quarterback. And uh, my, my freshman year, it, it was a turnaround because the athletic director's son, who was a junior, was a quarterback, and then he was a backup quarterback to the number one starting quarterback, whose nickname was uh, Shotgun. <laughs> he had a strong arm. And so I really got no playing time as a freshman at quarterback, and they used me as punt and kickoff return and a little at the corner, and I ended up playing the rest of my, my, my collegiate career at the corner. Mm-hmm. And uh, but it, it was a joy. But uh, again, another icon for me was the uh, Bart Starr. I love Bart uh, as a quarterback. And just to give you a hint on it, uh, my first game, my first NFL game in the league after preseason in 1967, opening season was at Lambeau Field against the first uh, Super Bowl winning Green Bay Packers. Mm. Second play from scrimmage, Bart tried to throw a quick out to all-pro boy Dollar. I picked it off and ran it in for 29 yards for a touchdown. And when I got into the end zone, I slammed the ball down, and it went sky high, and I looked up to the sky and put my hands on my hips, and I said, Lord, this is going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great start. Unbelievable. And, uh, yeah, I did read about that. Unbelievable. How, what a way to start in the yeah, NFL. Wonderful, and, wonderful. And, Lem, when we think of Jackson State, the name Walter Payton always comes up. May have been 
the best football player I've ever seen. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure your path, well, on the field, of course, I'm sure your paths crossed over the years. God rest his soul. Your ideas about Walter Payton. Yeah, sweetness. Uh, love Payton. Uh, played against him uh, for about nine years uh, when he was in the Chicago Bears. Just mm -hmm. an outstanding ball player. Uh, just a terrific uh, runner, as everybody knows. Very exciting. Uh, could throw the ball. He could pass. He, he had a great arm for throwing option passes on tosses and uh, returns as well. And just an uh, outstanding athlete. Uh, and again, may his soul rest in peace. And uh, I had a chance to play with his brother, uh, Eddie, Eddie Payton, Payton Eddie. who played with the Lions. Uh, mm -hmm. Kickoff, punt returns as well. And, and running back. and uh, But Sweetness uh, was just a great, great uh, all-time running back. Again, we're on the phone with uh, former defensive back Hall of Famer Lem Barney. Tony. And Lem, you know, I was very young and my father ran movies. And one of the movies that played when I was about 12 or 13, I was watching the NFL, was Paper Lion. And it was shot at the uh, Detroit Lions training campus. And you were there during that time. Did you get to meet George Plimpton? I certainly did. In fact, uh, I thought they was going to give me a Grammy for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of meeting George. And Alan Alda played George yeah. in the movie of The Paper Lion. And, I mean, it, and, uh, and uh, he, he, he was in the Mass series on television. Right. I mean, he was a great guy, and we filmed the movie, The Paper Lion, down in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. But George was a great guy. He came to uh, Detroit and played in a, 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 a preseason game over in that, the University of Michigan. We was playing, I can't remember the team we played, but he had like about two series at quarterback. I remember seeing that. Hmm. Yes, he had two series of uh, playing quarterback and uh, just a great guy. And then... Uh, the movie was just outstanding uh, with uh, the, the, the leading character, the, the late, great Alex Karras. But, yes, yeah. George was a, 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 a great fan of football. Yeah, and uh, as far as Alex, he must have really been an uh, incredible teammate. And just, a, I mean, I've only seen him, like, on television. I've seen him as a wrestler. What was he like as a teammate? As a teammate, he... he I wish I had 10 other guys like Alex. He played hard every down. Mm -hmm. uh, ironically, he was a guy that didn't like to practice. <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> he didn't like to practice, but he played his heart out on every down once that whistle blew on Saturday. Uh, just a tremendously great guy. Uh, took the game as a uh, very, he was very astute about the game. And I mean, he was one of the toughest guys. Even they tried to double team him. Uh, he was tough and would get between two guys trying to block him. Uh, just a great guy, and he, he he used to call me "Hey kid." That's what that's what <laughs> that's what he named me, my rookie. Hey kid, he said, "Don't let him get behind you." I said, "Okay, Alex." <laughs> but uh, just a great guy. And Lem, uh, as playing eleven years in the league like you did, of course you you, you play with so many against so many great quarterbacks and uh, receivers. Who are some of the tougher receivers that you remember uh, trying to cover? I mean, a Hall of Famer couldn't have too many problems, but there had to be some wide receivers that had an incredible amount of talent you went up against. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I played against uh, <clears throat> the Redskins, who has two Hall of Famers uh, uh, <laughs> right before me. It was Bobby Mitchell and uh, Charlie Taylor. Oh, yeah, great players. Uh, outstanding. Yeah. And... Uh, just uh, just some tremendous guys. Uh, Fred Bolitnikoff and, uh, from the uh, Oakland Raiders, uh, outstanding receiver, ran patterns to uh, perfection. Uh, Paul Warfield, Cleveland Browns, another uh, dynamic receiver that ran patterns uh, the way you draw them up on, a, on, on the board for, in, in the classroom. Paul was just a great uh, receiver. Uh, I mean, everybody in the league, I mean, regardless of being in the Hall of Fame or just making All-Pro, you know, I respected every guy that lined up out there in the front of me on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Even if it was somebody that was selling hot dogs that was in the front of me, yeah. I was going to respect him because he did have a chance to beat me. But, I mean, you know, the, the guys that I named were, 
were guys that I really idolized uh, during the years of uh, college and high school and then getting a chance to play against them. It was a joy. And let me uh, playing 11 years in the league, and we're going to talk uh, toward the end of the show later, we're going to feature the 1970 Lions, probably Joe Schmidt's best team at 10-4. and four. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the Lions team itself, during your reign, uh, they just never got to the point where they were in contention for a championship. I mean, did that, did that get frustrating for you throughout your career to see other guys uh, that you played against on TV come January? Well, uh, I wouldn't call it frustrating. Uh, mm. It was a little depressing. Though. Depressing, yeah. Uh, uh, realizing that uh, I think we had uh, enough talent uh, to have uh, – Played in more. I only played in one playoff game my entire career, my mm-hmm. entire eleven-year career. That's right. And ironically enough, it's the lowest-scoring playoff game in the history of the NFL. Uh, we lost five to nothing uh, to the Cowboys, <laughs> and uh, it, it, it it was always a struggle for us. Uh, quarterback scenario uh, up and down. Uh, Greg Landry. Uh, yeah. Was a, a fine quarterback, yes, a was. good scrambler. Bill Munson uh, was a, a, a fine quarterback. I had Carl Sweet Tan and Milt Plum as quarterbacks, uh, but we, we we had some great wide receivers as well. Earl McCullough and Larry Walton and Ron Jesse, uh, great uh, tight ends. Uh, late great Hall of Famer Charlie Sanders, may his soul yeah. rest in peace, and. Uh, Craig Cotton is a backup tight end. Uh, we, we, we had the equipment. Uh, the great Mel Farr, may his soul rest in peace, uh, mm-hmm. running back. Um, Alty Taylor, another fine running back. We, we, we had the tools. We just, we just couldn't uh, manifest that over the hill uh, again after playing in that first playoff. Yeah. Minnesota and Green Bay pretty much uh, demanded the uh, respect in the Central Division during my tenure. Yeah, and that was the, the old black and blue The division, old black and Tony, blue, yeah. Yes, sir. Black they, and blue, yes, sir. Where they played outdoors for most of the time, and we remember watching it well. Again, we're on the phone with Lem Barney uh, having a wonderful conversation and talking about the old days of the NFL uh, when the ground was hard, Tony. When that, that's it was right. really hard. In and some the men were things. harder. <laughs> uh, but uh, go ahead, Tony. You know, Lem, I uh, I did not realize, uh, and I apologize, that uh, you were singing on records with Marvin Gaye, and he was trying out for the Lions, kind of all at the same time. Absolutely, uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> you know. Uh, ironically enough, uh, I, I got a chance to uh, meet Marvin at Jackson State when I was at Jackson State Motown during those years, during the 60s, the early 60s, middle 60s, on into the 70s, they did a lot of touring. And uh, I saw Marvin uh, on campus, uh, didn't talk to him, uh, but I mean, you know, Smokey Robinson, The Temptations and everybody, and I said, wow. And then ironically, I get drafted by the Detroit Lions. I said, wow, I'm going to be Motown. And uh, after my first year, I, 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 I said to myself, if I had the time off in training camp, my second year, this is the second year of training camp, I was going to try to go in the city and find out where Marvin Gaye lived and go visit him. And uh, some guys that was uh, in camp saying, well, he plays at a Palmer Park uh, public golf course in Detroit at Woodward and Seven Mile. Uh, and mm-hmm. it wasn't that far from training camp. So that morning after the first practice, and after lunch, I said, I'm going to go and see if I can find him at this golf course before the second second uh, training uh, session that evening. So I drive down Woodward Avenue, and I go to the golf course, and I go in, and I ask the pro there, and says, Mr. Marvin Gaye playing today? And the guy says, no, he hasn't been here today, he says, but he doesn't live that far. If you go down seven miles and make a right on Livernois and make a left on out of drive, he's in the second block. And he drives a big Broham Cadillac. <laughs> oh, I couldn't miss it. And I drive, and I see it, and I drive, drive in the driveway, and I go up to the door, and I ring the bell in there, one of them musical chime bells. Boing, boom, boom, boing, boing, boom, boing, boom, boom. And I step back, and nothing happened. So I was getting ready to go and hit it again, and the door opened, and he said, hey, what's going on? I said, 
Mr. Marvin Gaye, he says, yes. I said, look, my name is Lim Barney. I'm with the Detroit Lions, man. I just wanted to stop by and just let you know I, I'm an avid fan of yours, and I just admire your singing. He said, who did you say you were? I said, <laughs> Lim Barney. He said, not the guy that plays with the Detroit Lions. I said, yes, sir. He said, man, you're too small to be that guy. <laughs> I said, well, you want, me to, you want to cover me? You want me to cover you? He said, no, come on in. So I went in, and, wow. and we got to talking. And I mean, he just started talking, started talking. He was, And I look at my watch, and I got 20 minutes before the second session is to start. Now, I'm 20 miles away from the training <laughs> camp. I ran red lights. <laughs> it was like I was a, a police or an ambulance getting back to training camp, and I got his phone number, and I got back, and I didn't have a chance to get my ankles taped or anything, but I got my uniform on, and I ran out there, didn't have my shoulder pads on, and got to the field before they started doing calisthenics. Whew, thank you, Jesus. No <laughs> fine or anything, but again, I had his number, and we became close friends, and I called him. He started coming to Lions games on Sunday during, during the regular season, and I would visit him, and he would go out to the uh, dining room places where we would have meals after a game at Tiger Stadium, and everybody got a chance to meet Marvin, and then Smokey Robinson started coming to the games. I would give him tickets along with Marvin, and we became great friends. And so I would go visit Marvin. He said, look, why don't you come over go by the studio with me tomorrow, Lamb? I said, okay, I'd love to. So I went over. Mel and I would go by the studio and listen to him uh, rehearsing everything, and then finally one day he said, look, Lim, you and Mel come go by the studio with me. And Lim, you take this part, Mel, you take this part. So as a result, when when, when, when the song first comes on, it's Mel and I. And we say, say, hey, brother, what's happening? He said, yeah, brother, solid. I recognize your voice. I recognize his voice. Mother, mother. Song starts it. And you can hear us all through the whole song, and as a result, we end up getting a gold record. How about that? It, you know, it's it's God it's bless you. A fascinating yeah, story, you. and and you know, you 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 gave us a, a little preview a few weeks ago. You sang for us a little bit on that show, and Lem, at, at, at age seventy, you still got it, man. <laughs> <laughs> he still sounded good. I mean, but yeah, that uh, what a recording, Tony. Now you said you recognize. I Len's recognize voice. The, the tenor of his voice. The the, the fellow's talking in the beginning. Hey man, what's up? it's it's Lem. Wow. Yeah. 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 That's what a great guy. And I mean, you know, he and, and so he he wanted to play football after that. He went on to Shirley uh, Shirley Eater did a column on him, and uh, yeah. it was on the Tonight Show and a lot of. Uh, national television program saying he's trying out with the Detroit Lions. And so, you know, Joe Schmidt had met him and enjoyed him coming over to Larco's, the restaurant that we'd always feature, future going to after the games at Tiger Stadium on Sunday. And he got a chance to meet Marvin. And, he's, and so Marvin is saying he's going to try out with the Detroit Lions. So Coach calls me and asks me, said, Lim, what's this stuff about Marvin that he's going to try out with the Detroit Lions? I said, Coach, I keep telling Marvin he, he, he can't do anything until he get a clearance, you know. Mm -hmm. So he said, look, you bring him by, down to the office uh, on Monday and, and let me talk to him. Well, I go by Marvin's. I say, Marvin, coach want to see you down to the office. He said, Lamb, this is it. This is it. I say, I don't know if it's it or not, yeah. but coach wants to see you. So we go down to the office and coach asks, I say, look, Marvin, here you want to charge with the Detroit Lions. I say, oh, coach, I believe the first time I touch a ball, I'm going to score a touchdown. He said, well, I love your attitude. He said, look, Marvin, do you have any uh, film from when you played in college? He hung his head down between his legs and said, Coach, I never played in college. <laughs> he said, well, okay, well, Marvin, what about when you played in high school? Do you have any film? He hung his head between his legs again and said, Coach, I never played in high school. Well, Coach stood up and said, well, what the heck make you think if you didn't play in college or high school, you can play in the league? He said, Coach, I've been working out with Mel and Lamb, and I just believe I'm ready to play, and I... Worked out up at U of M, and I, I'm ready, Coach, if, if you give me the chance. I, I, I think I can score a touchdown the first time you throw a ball to me. So, Coach, said, I love your attitude. I, I'll talk talk to Lemmy and see what I can do. We're going to have a little tryout in a few weeks, and uh, I'll see what happens. So, Coach tried him out at wide receiver and at running back, and uh, he did okay. I mean, he did okay because he had been training with Mel and I 
for about three and a half months. And uh, he looked good, but Coach said he just didn't have what he needed to allow him to get a chance to go out without having any contact before. And he didn't really want to risk him getting injured anyway. But he appreciated Coach giving an opportunity anyway. That's just a fascinating a neat story. story. The entire Motown thing. And, and uh, let me, you, you mentioned Mel Farr, and Tony and I have spoken about him. Uh, he, he played seven years all with Detroit. To us, he was the ultimate multi-purpose back. Uh, just a very talented guy. Could catch balls, too, out of the backfield. Uh, the tell us pass, a little bit yeah. more about, well, we know how close you guys were. He was your singing partner, roommate, etc. But how about Mel Farr, the man? Yeah, uh, just a genuine man, a great brother. Uh, Mel and I, I think, uh, <clears throat> gave the National Football League something that has never happened before we came in the league in 1967, and I don't really think it's, it's, it's happened since we've been in the league. We both gave the league offensive and defensive rookies of the year, same team, same year, 1967. That's amazing. And... Uh, Again, uh, you, you, you spell his first name, it's Mel, M-E-L, and if you reverse that, it's L-E-M, backwards. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's ironically, and Mel and I roomed our first five years together, and then we end up breaking the, the racial rooming, you know, on trips. So we'd go away, traveling trips, you'd go to different cities. Right. Mel roomed with Bill Malinchek, a wide receiver, uh, who was the Caucasian, and then I roomed with Mike Weger, who played safety with me uh, at, at Detroit uh, as, a, as my roommate. And it made news all around the country for, for whatever reason. But we just tried to tried to make it easy. We, we, we enjoyed it. And, I mean, it's teammates, so it's like brotherly love. Yeah. But uh, Mel was just an outstanding running back, uh, could catch the ball coming out of the backfield, had uh, – Great moves and uh, just didn't have the blocking uh, that that that, was, that that he really needed during those years. Our offensive line really wasn't structured, mm -hmm. but just an outstanding athlete, Mel was. Again, we have a few more minutes left with Hall of Famer Lem Barney, Tony. You know, and uh, Lem, you um, you guys played for a number of years in Tiger Stadium, downtown Detroit. The cold, the wind, the rain, the snow. I remember watching the games. They had to keep wiping the cameras so you could. It was absolutely unbelievable. And did you guys feel, you know, when you got a team in, hey, we got them where we want them, or, you know, hey, we'd like to be playing in warmer weather? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, it was uh, an adjustment. It was an adjustment period. I mean, that's what the game is about adjustment. Uh, Detroit, uh, Central Division, the Central Division was all. Un uncovered, uh, mm -hmm. Tiger Stadium, Lambeau Field, uh, Georgia, uh, Chicago at Soldier Field, <laughs> Minnesota Vikings. I mean, it, it it was outside. I mean, you know, and the colder the colder it got, the uh, harder the ground became. And I mean, it was it was tough to make those adjustments. And it was a joy playing in the Silverdome uh, once uh, our, my last four years in the mm -hmm. league. But uh, we still had to go out and play in that hawk in Green Bay, Chicago, and Minnesota. Uh, but, I mean, it's something you have to do. It's an adjustment you have to make. I mean, it was cold in New York, um, Pittsburgh. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's it's the adjustment. Uh, un, 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 unlike the, uh, the league is not going to have a lot of domes up uh, because if they were, I'm sure they would have been established by now. And it's just the way you have to go. You have to make the adjustment. Yep. And Lem, you retired in '77. You were 32 years old at the time. Yeah, uh, you picked off three inter three balls that year. You were st still playing at a very high level. Uh, what made you think that I think I've had enough, or uh, the time has come for me? Well, I mean, you know, I'd had about uh, five coaches. <laughs> yeah, five coaches, uh, four coaches in, in my 11-year career, and. I said uh, a lot of the guys that was with me when I first came in, the coaches were getting rid of, and I just said I'm going to let it go myself. Yeah. Uh, they were bringing in a lot of other ball players I didn't think had, and uh, in, in my ideology of uh, grading players, 
had the skills that some of the guys who was being cut mm-hmm. or traded mm-hmm. uh, didn't have. So I just said, I'm, I'm going to let it go. And uh, uh, the greatest, the greatest uh, uh, length that we got as a team was the five to nothing playoff. And so yeah. I said, that's it. Uh, but had seven Pro Bowls, and uh, that was a joy to play in uh, seven Pro Bowls. And I uh, had a great time doing that out in Los Angeles. And uh it, 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 and I think if I'd have still been playing now, <laughs> mm. <laughs> ironically, we wouldn't have got too much further, you know. Yeah. But mm. uh, it, it was a joy, and I, and I said eleven was good, and I was just going to step out, and I had no regrets after I left. It, it was a joy leaving uh, with the uh, physical uh, fitness that I was able to maintain during the years that I played. And the Hall of Fame induction in 1992 had to be one of the greatest days of your life, Len. Probably your entire childhood flashed before your eyes. That day you were elected with Al Davis, John Mackey, John Riggins. Uh, That's football royalty. Uh, But uh, what? just a few memories of that day, Len. Uh, Very special for you and your family. Yeah, very special. Very special, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, and uh, everybody was asking me what my speech was going to be. I said, well, you just have to listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I mean, the reporters, everybody would say, you know, a Hall of Fame, you know, blind, blind. You, what's, what, what's your speech going to be? I said, you got to come down and listen to it. If you don't come down, you just have to get it recorded and all. And um, I, I, I was thinking to myself all along, now, what am I going to do? What, what, what intro should I do? So should I sing? I said, man, I'm going to sing. Oh, wow. Yeah, maybe I should make a song. So I called the hall and I said, has, has anybody who was in Shrine ever sing before? They say, sing? I said, yes. Like, sing a song. I said, no. Why? I said, oh, I was just asking. I was just asking. So <laughs> I called quite a few people and nobody said nobody ever sang before. So I said, ah, here's my chance. So my my coach, Jimmy David, who played with Coach Schmidt during the 53 and the 57 championship team, uh, championship games, who was my defensive coordinator, introduced me into the Hall of Fame. And he said, if there was ever a defensive back that was any greater than Lem Barney, I've yet to see him. Mm-hmm. I now introduce to you Lem Barney, Detroit Lions. So the crowd went crazy. So I get up to the podium, relax myself. And I came out for once in a lifetime. A man knows a moment. One wonderful moment when fate takes his hand. And this is my moment. My That's... destiny calls me. So I gave him a round of uh, for once in a lifetime. Just... Man. The crowd <laughs> that is crazy. Just so good. It's so good. <laughs> So uh, unique, and uh, my goodness, uh, what an honor it is to hear that. Tony, final question for F- Final question. Let's bring it to today, Lem. Huh? You're watching today's game, everything going on with today's game. Um, some things are similar. Other things have changed. You're before the TV set or you're in the stadium on a Sunday. What do you think? I miss it. I don't miss it. I'm glad when I played. What's wrong with these guys? You tell us. Well, you know, um, I, I don't watch as much as I used to, mm-hmm. uh, and, and it's nothing against the game at all. I mean, like the game is going to go on. Um, I, I, I sometimes think I've had enough of it. I enjoyed, uh, again, my 11-year tenure in the league. I enjoyed broadcasting for about, nine, for about uh, 11 years after I got out of ball with uh, BET, Black Entertainment Television, mm-hmm. Bob Johnson, uh, doing colleges that I played at, uh, uh, played against, Jackson State and Gramlin, Southern University, Tennessee State, and, you know, schools like uh, 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 that statue, and I enjoyed it. And, I mean, you know, I, I'd been around the game for a long time, and I really enjoyed it, but, you know, I really don't miss the game at all. Like, I hear a lot of former guys that I played with and played against, Man, I sure wish I could play today. And I, I look at him, and it, and it lets me know when a guy wants to go back out there now, he didn't give it everything that he had when he was there. Mm. Couldn't have, because the game is far greater than it was when the time we played. Mm. And uh, I enjoyed those times, and I look back on them fondly. 
and just thank God that I was able to have played the game and showed my athletic skills and talents that he had given me. And uh, I used them. I didn't lose them. I used them. And so I don't miss the game at all because of the virtue of being able to broadcast it for those many years and watching it. And so uh, I don't miss it at all. Mm -hmm. You know. He left it all on the field, seven-time Pro Bowl selection, seven-time All-Pro, and the 1960s All-Decade team. Lem, we can't thank you enough. It's been an honor We've to speak honored. with you. And uh, it's the, the time just flew by, and you've been very generous with your time. Second time we've spoken, and it just gets better every time. Uh, we wish you well, sir. We'll be in touch, and uh, you continue to do all the great things you do, sir. It's thank you, brothers, thank very you. much, and God bless to both of you and your families. Thank you. Take you care, too. Lem. Good night. Uh, good night. Bye-bye now.